Good morning to you. Mark Scott with HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. This will be the last day that I have to say that until December because tomorrow begins the Eastern Pacific hurricane season, and that's good enough for us. So we'll scratch off the off-season part, and we'll just call this the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion beginning tomorrow, May the 15th. But today, Monday, May the 14th, this is the last of the off-season editions of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. Thanks for joining me. We do have a lot to talk about, so let's jump right in. The Southern Oscillation Index overall has taken a dive, especially the 30-day index. Leveled off here in the last few days, but this is the key for me is this 90-day average. And while it was a gentle slope down, it has leveled out and is starting to climb up just a little bit, telling me overall that the pattern is such that it is more of a neutral signal, the pressure pattern kind of oscillating back and forth, no real solid indication of a westerly wind setup where we have lower pressures in the eastern Pacific so that the net flow of air is from west to east, reversing the trade winds, creating an El Nino. That does not seem to be the case, and we can see that even further evidenced by the subsurface equatorial temperature anomalies here and this is updated as of the 8th of May and you can see over here in the eastern Pacific uh, this was trying to make some inroads to surface and start spreading some warmth in the eastern Pacific but now it's got some cracks in it so to speak and I know this is kind of being nitpicky but this all matters this has not made much of any progress reaching the surface here in the eastern two-thirds of the equatorial Pacific and you know, we're two weeks away from the Atlantic hurricane season beginning. Most of the modeling indicating neutral conditions, maybe slightly warmer than neutral for the season, and that's not going to be enough to have much of a hindrance on the Atlantic hurricane season activity, uh, in my opinion, and I think other people share that opinion as well. There's probably going to be other things that will make this season less active than last year, but that tells us nothing about where whatever forms goes or how strong they'll be when they get there. We'll address that another time, but I don't think that El Nino is going to be a factor this year, uh, despite this large area of warmth in the subsurface. Uh, just something we try to monitor here, and we'll take a look at this from time to time throughout the Atlantic hurricane season, probably until about August or so. And then everything's set into motion, and it kind of doesn't matter. In the Gulf of Mexico, we do have this little area of interest. It's not even an invest yet. In other words, they have not assigned a number. They use 90 through 99 for these suspect areas and the letter L for Atlantic. So you'll hear that all hurricane season long, 90L or 99L or 93L or what have you. Well, this hasn't even been designated as that yet, which I believe it would be 90L, unless we've already had one. I just... It's too early for me. I can't remember. It matters not because this is not going to be a big problem uh, other than rain, and rain can be a big problem. We'll talk about the impacts in a moment. What is this system? Well, it's a broad area of low pressure, and you can see that on the map here uh, where they have painted. This is the two-day outlook, 30% chance of development. It's a pretty broad area of low pressure. We'll take a look at a satellite picture that's better resolution in a moment, but it's at the surface and then it's interacting with an upper level low so some cold air in the upper levels of the atmosphere um, sort of a hybrid type system and if we go back to the five day you can see that it looks like it may try to move up towards the Florida panhandle in terms of any center but it's the east of the center all up through this area into the southeast United States that's going to have the impacts from this and what will those impacts be well you can see that a little bit here on the GOES-16 satellite shot. I think they call this the geocolor version. Beautiful shot here. Some heavier convection just offshore of southwest Florida. There's the peninsula in there roughly. The Carolinas up here. So there is some upper level outflow and divergence, but there's also this upper level low tangled in like this, and we can see that a lot better on this gorgeous water vapor version. There's the upper level energy kind of wrapping in. There's a surface low down at the surface, of course. Some upper level divergence or outflow over here. So you've got this complex blending of weather systems. And there is a 
very noticeable comma shape to this overall system. But you can see that it's broad and spread out, not bundling the energy if you have followed my videos for any time, especially and obviously during the hurricane season. You know how I talk about that, that these systems have to bundle that energy and you get more efficient thunderstorm development that way, a tighter wind field. This is broad and spread out, impacting a very large area. And these greens that you see in here represent more water vapor and thus more heavy rainfall underneath. And that will spread throughout the peninsula and then eventually into the southeast over the next few days. Gulf of Mexico, now this is interesting, a little bit of Monday morning humor. That's a dragon, <laughs> right? That's exactly what that looks like. I did not doctor this at all. I promise. And this looks like some kind of a weird, like something from Ghostbusters. You know, that, that green thing from, I guess, the 80s version of Ghostbusters. Was it in the re-release? I don't remember the reboot. But I saw that. I was like, my goodness, that looks exactly. There's the eye and, you know, the horn on the head and whatever. At least I'm not just crazy. It looks like a dragon. Well, what is that? Well, this is part of the loop current that's poking up into the gulf happens to look like a dragon okay and uh, it represents in fact all of this green area all through here and now even up along the shelf water areas where water temperatures are 26 degrees Celsius or higher and why is that important that's typically the threshold that we look for for tropical cyclone development and sustaining uh, roughly 80 degrees Fahrenheit 79 and a half degrees something like that so you notice that the eastern Gulf over here where our low is, down in the Florida Straits and just off of Cuba, yeah, the water temperatures are barely warm enough, but over here, along the west coast of Florida, where this system is going to traverse over the next few days, water temperatures are still 77, 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's just not a lot of upper level ocean heat content to fuel a deep system. So don't worry about this in terms of wind. Um, you know, maybe some gusty winds here and there, especially in exposed areas. Choppy local conditions on your sea state. So if you've got a small craft or you're going out on a jet ski or whatever, and in squally weather, I guess advise against that. But, you know, the main thing's going to be the rainfall from this. The Gulf just not quite warm enough with heat content to fuel anything, even if the upper levels were more ideal and the fact that they aren't will inhibit this thing from developing and organizing too much. I think it does have potential to maybe become a subtropical depression, which means more or less that the energy is more spread out. It's got some of those hybrid features in it. So it's more of a subtropical, meaning that it formed in the subtropics, uh, overall characteristic features. It's complicated, but and then maybe it becomes more tropical looking these are all textbook sort of classroom classifications. What it means for you is rain. That's the bottom line. Those are the impacts. Uh, and I'll get into that more in just a moment. Again, just kind of pointing out here, this part of the Gulf also kind of below normal overall. Sea surface temperature wise, this is from May the 10th, but it's probably still fairly valid for even today, four days later. So this does not have a lot going for it in terms of energy to develop further. Um, also, it's May, and this is typically the area, you know, the time of year when there is some development. You can see it's not zero, but we're outside the hurricane season in terms of a calendar. So climatology is not really on the side of this. It's an interesting anomaly, an interesting feature, but uh, not a harbinger of things to come, nothing like that. Sometimes these things happen, especially now that we have such accurate and rapidly updating data collecting right satellite and radar and all kinds of things it, you can't miss it so the impacts that's what's important okay we've talked about some of the structure and whatever with the system now what does it mean for you well down here in the keys let's use the different color down here in the keys maybe as these squalls come through some heavy lightning heavy lightning heavy rain and frequent lightning is what i meant to say and then a lot of rain up here along the peninsula, maybe some tornadoes from time to time. The atmosphere is already spinning, and it's unstable, and you get any of these strong thunderstorm updrafts, you might be able to spin up a brief tornado, maybe some water spouts. Should be some photogenic opportunities for some gray clouds, 
uh, just sort of that, you know, the sea was angry that day, my friends kind of looked to things, right, whatever, uh, tropical, you know, even though it's May, you'll see some of that from people down there, I'm sure, on social media. Florida needs the rainfall in many cases, so this is good. And you can see this is moving up into the Big Bend as well. And then eventually up into the southeast proper, uh, probably not as far west as Mobile, but maybe. I think New Orleans, Baton Rouge is, is going to miss out on this, but we'll watch and see. It's going to be a slow mover over time. And uh, James Spann tweeted this earlier from Pivotal Weather, kind of showing the seven-day rainfall forecast. And this is just a general broad brush stroke, if you will, of what to look for. The heaviest rains perhaps over the peninsula and just offshore, maybe reaching the low country of South Carolina. And then some you know, little areas up here, stripes of heavier precip. The overall idea is, though, a nice blanket of precipitation for the southeast to help back off the drought pedal just a little bit. It was getting kind of dry. Uh, I was in Atlanta yesterday for Mother's Day, went to the Georgia Aquarium, and hot Atlanta. That's what I was telling the kids. I was like, that's why they call it hot Atlanta. It's kind of, well, we know the, it, it felt dry yesterday relative to where it can get, but you could just tell, all right, the soil was kind of drier, and it's sort of that dryish heat. And we need to dent that quickly because it can get out of control. A lot of times drought will help to foster uh, a heat wave and prolonged heat and then even more drought. So this tropical system will actually be beneficial. Uh, so just be careful out there if you're traveling. I want to remind you, you know, you got the I-95 corridor that comes down here. That's not quite it, but you get the idea. And then I-10 through this way. And, of course, the turnpike and I-4 or whatever like that. Roughly speaking, bottom line, slow down out there. Heavy rain means the possibility of some traffic problems. So leave yourself lots of time if you're traveling, all right? Be aware. No hydroplaning, not allowed. So here's the GFS at the 5,000-foot level showing the vorticity. And this is what I was talking about earlier with the bundling of energy. Later in the hurricane season, or you can go back at some of my videos from last year, and you can see what this looks like when things kind of go crazy and this is not it there's our system right there let's use the red um, you know amorphous in shape not round the energy not being bundled not much going on with it overall later in this season or like I said if you go back and look at some videos from last year look at Irma look at Harvey when it really started getting going but Irma Maria and some of those other ones are great examples of when the energy focuses and you get these powerful Cape Verde hurricanes. Well, this is no such thing, not anywhere close. So here's sort of a look, a uh, little rough trough axis uh, drawn in here. You can see the change in wind in here. You know, it's got this old front hung up in here, broad low pressure, roughly at the surface to 5,000 feet or so, and then above that is the upper level energy. So let's put this into motion, and you're going to notice a couple of things. Move this guy out of the way. Watch as the ridge offshore really strengthens over here, and then watch down in this region as the energy tries to consolidate right there just off of Tampa. You can see it tries but never really gets going. Even at the 5,000-foot level, the winds are you know, no more than maybe 25, 30 knots. Down at the surface in some stronger squalls, you might get some 25, 30-knot winds occasionally. But that's about it. This is mainly going to be a rainmaker. But, man, look at that ridge really exerting its influence here. If I can get my colors to come back up over the western Atlantic uh, over the next five days. So there's our system as I draw on everything. Never really pulls it together. Maybe at days two or so to three, 48 to 72 hours, it might be a little bit more tropical looking but that's about it i just can't get over this the size and strength of that bermuda high out there look at that wow hot and steamy in the southeast and if this holds well we'll just wait and see what happens in august and september but we'll see this kind of shows you what might happen i mean honestly we'll talk about it for a second if this pattern stays and you have systems coming through this way <clears throat> well you can just figure it out from there but we'll wait and see it's May, and it's already lots of ridging. That's pretty something else. All right, moving along before I get ahead of myself too much. 
It is coming, though. Hurricane season's almost here, as obviously there it is. All right, severe weather. We're still talking about some lower 48 weather from time to time. As we transition more into hurricane season, we'll leave that behind because severe weather generally sort of wanes and goes away in terms of the big threats after June. Uh, but it's really, really been low. You know, not much out here in Tornado Alley to speak of. Uh, this is sort of your ring of fire. We've heard about the ring of fire inaccurately in the news as related to the volcano in, at Kilauea. But in the United States and uh, some other parts of the world, you get these rings of fire around these big ridges that form, you know, kind of outlining it there a little bit. And this will be no exception. You get these mesoscale convective systems that come across the tops of these ridges, and that counterclock or that clockwise flow around the ridge, and these impulses of energy ride around the top. So you folks in the Mid-Atlantic, D.C., uh, Alexandria, down to maybe Fredericksburg, an enhanced risk of severe thunderstorms today, hail, straight line winds, tons of rain, and lots and lots of lightning. But you notice, again, Tornado Alley, absent of any major severe weather, the Tornado chasers, anybody going on chase casing, chase case, I can't even say it, a chase case, <laughs> a vacation where you go storm chasing. I don't think I'm going to be able to say it. We could be here all day trying. Um, it's going to be scant, let's say that. You won't have much to chase on your vacation. It's just the way it goes sometimes. Um, the next few days, and now I want to show you this, the day two outlook tomorrow, if this will advance for me, come on. You gonna work? It's gonna leave me hanging. That's day three. There's day. All right, there we go. There's day two. Uh, tomorrow, a little bit farther to the north or further north, towards the Upper Chesapeake Bay, Southeast Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. And I want to end on this note. This was from uh, Ben Knoll. He posted this earlier. And we do have a pretty big population group up here, right? So I figured this is very worthy to talk about that tomorrow afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, and I'll mention this tomorrow as well, because I will be back tomorrow doing another update. Um, this is what the three-kilometer NAM, the North American model, the high-res version, it's simulated radar, I guess you could say, indicating a pretty good squall line. So you folks up in the mid-Atlantic and uh, even parts of the Northeast, you know, look at that coming across the Cape, Boston, Southeast Mass, into Southeast Jersey even, and down the upper Chesapeake, as I mentioned, tomorrow could be pretty active. Ugh. All right, we covered a lot. There's a lot to talk about. It's only May 14th, my goodness. So I'll be back tomorrow and um, probably in the morning again, and we'll see what's happening with this system. I did not mention the GFS Fantasy Cane because it's not worth mentioning. As I, you know, we talked about it a little bit a few days ago, the model was showing the GFS in particular. Um, I mean, it was developing a hurricane way out in the long range, you know, 10, 11, 12 days out plus. And the thing about that is it never got closer in time. So if it's showing it at day 10 on, you know, Monday, then by Wednesday and Thursday, it should start showing it at days five and six, right? And it never did. So it kept pushing it out into time beyond its high resolution time frame where chaos theory and, and other things that just go on with the physics that are far beyond my comprehension to either explain or understand, it just it just gets wild. And you know, people were complaining about it that it's a garbage model. I mean, we're talking about ten plus days out. I mean, I don't even know why they run it that far to be honest with you. But if you're like, oh man, that thing sucks. It shows development at days twelve and fourteen and it never happens. All right, well, let me know when we have reliable global model deterministic runs two weeks out, and you can be upset about it when it's not reliable after that. I mean, it's not supposed to be. As advanced as we are, I think five to seven days is about as good as we can ask for, and even one to three days, sometimes things bust. So bottom line, maybe a chance that something tries to develop out of this Central American gyre that's going to show up, but other than that, and we'll talk about that more tomorrow, uh, I'm not too worried about the long range. We are almost to hurricane season, so you should be paying attention anyway. That's what it comes down to. All right, that's it for me for today. Thanks for tuning in. We covered a lot. I appreciate your time and your attention. I am Mark Suddeth for HurricaneTrack.com. 
We'll talk again tomorrow morning.